I believe that, well, I stopped the music a little short tonight because that message and that song you just heard is exactly what I came to tell you. And I felt this in my heart and just pray that the Lord would help me to deliver it. But 1 Peter chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 3, okay? Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fades not away and it's reserved in heaven for you. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Ready to be revealed in the last time. You know what we're going to be looking forward to seeing. What we have in store for us those that are saved and washed in the blood. It's not been revealed yet. We're not living in the time of the millennial kingdom. We're not living in the time of heaven on earth. The Bible calls this a present evil world. But what we have on the inside of us, the Bible and the scripture says is a lively hope. Christ Jesus is alive tonight. And whether you as a believer know it or not, you are so intrinsically tied to him that his future is your future. Amen. His past is your past. Amen. That's what it means. He points us to the resurrection of Christ. And guess what? Your resurrection was Christ's resurrection. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. The great apostle Paul would teach that in his epistles. How that we were baptized into his death. Into his burial. And into his resurrection. And that's what Peter meant when he said you've been begotten again. You've been born again. You've been born into the family of God. And now where God is going, you are going. Hallelujah. Here you have this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give him praise. Yeah. If you believe that tonight. Begotten again unto a lively hope. No hope before we came to God. No hope before we found Christ. But in Christ. We found his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And now I have resurrection life in me. So guess what? Jesus, when he died, there was no doubt. He paid the sin debt. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. But it doesn't stop there. Because you see, when I lay this body down, because the blood of Jesus has taken care of every sin. Yes, sir. Because no longer does over Je Joseph Larson's life hang the sin penalty. Amen. Because of the blood of Jesus, I will die, yes. And my, hallelujah, my body will go to dust. But I'm going to rise again. Yes. Hallelujah, I'm going to rise. It's just as much a fact about me and you if you're saved tonight that you will rise again. Yes, hallelujah, he said I'm going to there a place for you. That where I am, you may be also. The resurrection of Christ was not just for Jesus. Hallelujah. So you can sing this song tonight and halfway believe it. But if you're saved, guess what? God's got a greater hold on you than you have on him. And when you die and lay down this body, guess what? Just like it was true of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, you're going to rise. I said you're going to rise. And you're going to see the Lord. Just like his word promised. That's what Peter meant. Something to shout about. That we've been begotten again. Unto a lively hope. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then he said this. To an inheritance incorruptible. It can't be corrupted. It's an inheritance. It's yours. You have received that inheritance through your elder brother Christ. And it fades not away. What a promise in God's word for us. An inheritance that fades not away. And is reserved in heaven for you. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Ready to be revealed in the last time. 
I haven't even prayed yet, and I still have a few scriptures I want to read, though. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with the fire. And I want to use that phrase as my subject tonight. Being much more, the trial of your faith, much more precious than of gold that perishes. How many know gold perishes? Yes. Amen. Mm -hmm. It might be found on the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. I toyed with this message in my heart before I began tonight, but I feel it's what the Lord wants. I know this. He wants you to know that you have a place prepared for you. And He wants you to know that this life is not all that it's... This life is not all that He has for us. I want to use simply, with the help of God, a title may be strange, but gold perishes. Let's pray tonight. Gold perishes. Dear God, I thank you today that you've begotten us again into a lively hope. Lord, we've been born again and bought into this kingdom, Lord, and brought into your fold. We just thank you tonight for your spirit that makes real the truths of your word. And Lord, I thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the music tonight. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to speak your word, your everlasting word, your word that is truth and will not fail. And I ask, Lord, that you would touch these here tonight. Lord, wherever they may be in their walk with you, or if they don't know you, Lord, I ask you, Lord, that you would transfix their minds, that they would see your eternal kingdom, Lord God, and that they would recognize the worth of what they have in Christ. Lord, I thank you for your grace tonight. And we say it all in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Gold perishes. The other day, well, let me start by saying this. There are times of prosperity in the Christian's life, and there are times of scarcity. I know many today in churches would like to think just because I'm God's son or God's daughter that I'm going to have a wealthy life and I'm going to have a healthy life. But how many know that's not always the case? And that's not because God doesn't want that for you and me. But it may not be God's best for you and me. But the other day I was thinking about what God has done recently in my life and God has been blessing me. And there are times He seemingly isn't. But, but lately, and like we've said it recently, uh, when it rains, it pours. Amen. And God loves us so much and He just wants to show us a blessing. He wants to shower us with blessings. Amen. He wants to give us good things. He said, I would that you would be in health and prosper even as your soul prospers. But, and there's a but, because every truth needs balance. As I said the other day, I recognize the blessings of the Lord. And listen, we can get caught up in material goods. How many know that, it, that to be true? Yes. Yes. We can get caught up in the here and now, and I think every man Every woman at some point is going to be presented with this. To search after a life of riches or to seek after God. Yes. To search after the temporal that my life may be all about the here and now or to seek ye first yes. the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. Yes. And he said all these things shall be added unto you. Yes. But the big problem in our hearts and in our spirits is that we get 
the wrong, we, let me say it right, we've searched after the riches, we search after the material things, and we don't do, as Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. And in my spirit, this word came to me, as I said, I was thinking about the great things God has been doing for me. And I just thought, you know, we just start to fantasize about all the wonderful things that he might bring us. Maybe a new car. Some of us need it. Some of us don't. Maybe a wonderful, huge, magnificent house, because I'm a huge, magnificent person. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Maybe a wonderful, I don't know, I guess the, the list goes forever. And we are a materialistic nation and people, and that is our culture. We are acquisitive, we want things, we want it now, and we're not ready to wait. Not ready to wait, okay. <laughs> but you get the picture and the point. But in my spirit, this verse came in my heart. And I believe it was a rhema word for just for me. Just the other day as I was talking to my wife about what God was doing for us and in us. And it was this. The trial of your faith is much more precious than gold that perishes. You see, God is seeking after a people that will believe him. And though he wants to bless us, guess what? God is in the faith building business. Yes, yes. It's the trial of your faith. And not even just your faith. The Bible says the trial of your faith is much more precious than gold that perishes. Amen. It's a theme in 1 Peter that he would get our minds on the things that will be eternal. As he says in chapter 1, it says, he says this. Well... For all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower thereof falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel was preached unto you. I want to read a verse in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. And it says this. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Familiar passage. We understand this. We've heard it. But that is quite a statement. He didn't say money was evil. He didn't say having good things was evil. But what Timothy and what Paul was trying to tell Timothy to tell the church was that your spirit can be wrong in the realm of money. And material things. Right. It's all about what I can get out of this. Come on. The love, he said, of money. The love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah. I'm not even sure I understand that all the way. I'm not sure any of us do. But I can promise you this, that the New Testament... Is quite emphatic about riches and how much of a crutch it can be to an individual. We have the rich man Lazarus who had wonderful things in this life. We have the rich man and Lazarus, excuse me, who had the rich man had wonderful things and he he, he experienced all that a man could experience. Yet he found himself in hell. And Lazarus, not having much, found himself in Abraham's bosom. And it's not just because of the money situation, but see, the poverty situation a lot of times brings people to a place where they recognize they need God. That's right. That's right. That's good. Amen. Amen. I'm not preaching a poverty gospel to you. But that is true. Not many mighty has God called. Come on. The Bible says. And the rich man found himself in hell. And, and Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. His poverty brought him to God. But, but, but the rich man's riches pulled him away from God. Yes. 
And the, the scripture says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And he's talking to Christians here, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. You mean someone can covet after money and err from the faith? Well, that's what the scripture says. And they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. In the parable of the sower, Jesus told us there were four things that will inhibit the word of God that is planted or has ceased to be planted on the inside of the heart of man. Number one, not understanding, he said. He said a sower went into a, a field and sowed seed. And some seed fell by the wayside, and on the wayside the fowls of the air came and devoured the seed. I'll get to it in a second, but just as a, a little uh, thought here. Wayside is a place where seed's not meant to be sown. It's a place where the farmer would trample on, and he would, he, it was hard in soil, so there was no place for that seed to lodge beneath the soil. And naturally, what happens? The seeds above the soil, you've seen it in movie, you've seen it in your own, you've seen it all, you've seen it, you've seen it, you've seen it, okay. <laughs> the birds of the air, in tongue time, man, you've seen it, okay. The birds of the air came and devoured the seed up. And then he says, he cast seed in a place, a stony place, and that was just, that the stone just beneath the surface, you see, they would plow the land, and you couldn't tell just on what you saw, it was a, a freshly plowed land. You could, you could not tell the content of the soil. Correctly? I mean, having a rough time tonight. <laughs> correct? Yeah. Yes, correct. <laughs> but you couldn't tell the content of the soil. And there would be sometimes a thin layer of dirt and just beneath the soil, the stones. And the seed, guess what? It has no place to grow. It didn't have a place to dig down deep and create roots. And so what the scripture says is that it withered away. No roots. As well, the last one, seed fell among the thorns. And the thorns choked the word. The seed, I'm sorry, the, I'm getting ahead of myself. The thorns choked the seed and it wasn't able to grow. Jesus turned around and explained that parable that he gave to the multitudes, to his disciples. And he said that the farmer who cast the seed on the wayside is like the man who hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not. That's the first inhibition to hearing and understanding. I'm saying it again, but that's the first problem that man in this parable comes in contact with. Not understanding. What's that mean? Simply, you don't understand how you fit in the, or how, how the word of the kingdom applies to you. You don't see yourself in any way a part of that message. And you don't see how that message in any way applies to you. And simply, you don't believe. Understanding not. It simply means you don't believe the words you're hearing. Right. So that's the first problem, not believing, not understanding that Jesus addressed. And he gave this parable to describe, he gave this parable to describe the preaching of the gospel in this day and age, in this age of grace, simply what it means. But then he said there was stony ground, it choked, it, 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 and it didn't, it, there was no root. What that typified was that the man who hears the word and he rejoices for a season that he heard the word, but when tribulation and persecution arise for the word's sake, yes. he is offended and he leaves the word, he, left, he leaves off the word, he stops believing because the persecution and the tribulation is too much. Yes. I'm sorry, I'll go back to the first one very quickly. The fowls of the air, when the seed was cast on the wayside, was a type of the powers of darkness, and they were a type of Satan. Yeah. Because that's exactly what Jesus said when he explained the parable. 
He said that the person who does not understand, Satan comes and takes away the seed that was sown on the inside of the heart. What does that mean? When you don't believe the gospel and you hear it and it goes in one ear and out the other, powers of darkness, but Satan himself comes to you and takes the seed out of your heart. I'm talking about the gospel. And he, he, you no longer have the ability to see as you did before, the chance to see. That's powerful. We must believe when we hear. We must respond by faith. If not, God really cast judgment upon those who do not believe. Because what he said in his scripture, those who believe shall be saved, but those who believe not shall be damned. Judgment passed. The sentence of judgment passed. When someone does not believe. So we have not believing, number one, is a problem. Number two, tribulation. Listen, some Christians, they, as the scripture said, they were saved in my opinion. They received the word. But when tribulation and persecution arose for the word's sake, they were offended and they cast off from believing. Yes. yes. <clears throat> and then he said this. He said that, and somebody fell by the, the, the seed that fell by the thorny ground is likened unto the person who hears the word, but the cares of the world, the cares of the world, the worry of the world, everything the world worries about, the cares of the world. And I'm telling you this because Jesus Christ said this. It's that important to us tonight. Then he said this, the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of riches yes. choked the word and the word became unprofitable. Yes. But some fell on good ground yes. and produced fruit. Yes. But if you just notice, I mean, Jesus mentioned riches, deceitfulness of riches. Why are they deceitful? Anybody thought of that? The deceitfulness of riches. What is that? What is he saying? I believe it's this. The deceitfulness of riches is that you, in your heart, desire to be rich. Desire to have good things. At the expense of your soul. Yes. And because you had a greater desire for riches and for the things of this world, you did not allow the word of the kingdom to stay and remain on the inside of your heart. And you've been deceived. Yes. The deceitfulness of riches. But my text tonight simply says that that seed, that word that was lodged on the inside of us and the trial of it is more precious than gold that perishes. Amen. Amen. The trial of our faith is more precious than gold that perishes. Maybe I'm not saying it right, or maybe we really struggle in this area. Let me say it to you this way. Our heart is wicked, it's deceitful, above all things, who can know it? If you don't have your faith centered in the cross of Christ, there's no telling what will come out of your heart. Yes. Why the cross? Because at the cross, Jesus Christ took our place, yes. But as Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Come on. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. Amen. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who yes. loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. What am I saying? 
I'll go here to explain. Money is a problem. Yes, I mean the love of money. By the way, our text says the love of money is the root of all evil. But we can idolize anything. And there's, but, I, but, but man's spirit is out of control, naturally. Our, our, our spirit is out of control. And you, you don't know what's going to come out next. I'm talking about those who don't know Christ. And even those who do know Him. Why a warning against loving money? Because if your faith isn't centered in the cross, you're going to have it in something else. You're going to be pursuing something else. Your, your mind, we can get off track very easily. You know what matters? What you do? Yes. You know that God didn't just waste His breath when He breathed the life of this Word and gave it through His apostles and warned us of these things. But, but how someone would give up the faith for the love of money, for temporal things. You don't think it happens? We need to check our hearts tonight. And we need to ask ourselves, do I care more about earthly possessions and temporal value of things? Or do I care about heavenly things? And do I care about the only thing that connects me from here to eternity, my faith? That's right. The love of money is the root of all evil. Gold perishes. Yes, yes. It's here for a time, but it's not something that is of eternal weight and eternal value. Your faith is more precious than gold. We'll go back to 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, You have inherited an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fades not away. It's reserved in heaven for you. See, the man of faith knows his, where his possessions are. The man of faith knows he has an inheritance incorruptible. And it fades not away. It's reserved in heaven for me. The man of faith knows that is where his reward lies. Jesus said, what profit does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but he loses his soul? He said, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust can corrupt and thieves break in and steal. But lay for yourselves up treasures in heaven. Yes. Where no moth or rust can corrupt and no thief can break through and steal. Amen. I'm struggling to get it across tonight. I'm struggling to tell you exactly how I feel about this. Let me say it to you this way. The Bible says in verse 6. After he says... God through faith unto salvation, who were kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice. What brings you joy? What brings you great joy? The Bible says, wherein you greatly rejoice. Amen. See, I think tonight. That one of the reasons why when someone says he's coming back on a silver cloud from glory, he's going to take me away. I'm looking now to the sign of his returning. And it won't be long. It may just be the day. I think the reason why a lot of times when we hear that, it doesn't do anything for us. is because our minds are so fixed on the here and now. Yes, yes. And we don't see how that, we don't understand, as I said earlier, we don't understand how that has anything to do with us. Come on. Because I'm all about my stuff. I'm getting what I want to get. I want to be rich. I want to have it wealthy. And I want to have it now. Yeah. That's right. And Satan has been so successful 
with stealing away your faith, our faith, and putting our focus on earthly riches That's and good. possessions. That's yeah. good. But it's deception. Yes. It's one of his favorite games to play with Christians. Hmm. But I don't have an interest in gaining the whole world and losing my soul. As I felt it in my spirit the other day, Lord, the trial of my faith is more precious than gold. What you take me through, whether it be through the fire, and guess what? He talks about heaviness and a season of manifold temptations. But I can go through it with joy, great joy, because of what he has prepared for me. And whether I'm rich or whether I'm poor, as Paul said, I have learned to be content with what I have. Because I don't find joy in the things of this world. I don't get joy because I have much things. For the, a man's life, Jesus said, does not consist in the things which he possesses. Just ask yourself tonight. Maybe I'm not saying it well. But why did Jesus press this issue so much? Why did he mention it? Why did the apostles, why did they, when they wrote the scriptures, why did they mention this problem so much? It's simply because we struggle with it. We want things instead of what God has for us. We want the temporal things of this world. It becomes attractive. We get our minds on it. We're just all about what I can get. And we have no sense of what God meant for us to have. Because we're not living by faith. Yes, yes. There's a story in the Bible. A man, Abraham and Lot. And they had herds. And they were becoming so great. Their substance was becoming so great. that the Bible, And the Bible says a strife arose between Lot and Abraham. Between him, the herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abraham. A strife arose. And Abraham came to Lot. He said, don't let this strife be between me and you. What should we do? And he said, there's much land. There's enough for all of us. There's enough for, uh, for us all to abide in peace. So you take what you want. And, and Lot chose for himself. He said, the Bible says this. He saw the well-watered plains of Jordan. And he chose based on the outward appearance of yes, things. Yes. I was studying about that passage, that strife that arose between the two, the herdsmen of, of Lot and the herdsmen of Abraham. And the fact that Abraham told Lot, don't let this strife be between me and you, showed this, that Abraham was living by faith, but Lot, his faith began to flag and he became the worldliness is what the writer said that was on the inside of Lot was bound to come out and manifest itself. It manifested itself in a strife with Abraham and eventually he found himself in Sodom and Gomorrah because his heart began to get off of the plan and the path of faith what God, see Abraham said you decide for me, Lord. I'm going to let Lot choose for himself. And whatever you want for me, I'll take it. And that's what a man of faith always says. He says that the, the, the lines have fallen under me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. The Bible says if the man build a house and God doesn't, they that labor, labor in vain, in vain that build it. Hallelujah. You can build your own house tonight, but it will fall. But if you have God build your house, and if you have God choose for you your inheritance. See, we have too many people trying to choose for themselves what their inheritance is because they've left the path of faith. Because a man that lives by faith is content with whatever God gives him. Hallelujah. And if we don't learn that lesson, we will, like Lot, find ourselves desiring earthly pleasures. We'll be choosing which direction we take based on outward circumstances alone.
because the well, because the plains were well watered, and he saw through his own eyes, he saw that hey, I can have a benefit from this. But guess what? He, as someone said, he didn't consider as he pitched his tent towards Sodom. The Bible says he did not consider the inward content of Sodom, which was wickedness. It was wicked. Because he chose based on material goods. He had his mind on what I can get off of, on the uh, covetous. It was a covetous mindset. And it was a lascivious mindset. He thought, what can I get? And guess what? When your spirit's out of control and all you're thinking about is what can I get? You won't consider that Sodom and Gomorrah is wicked. Yes, yes, right. You will not consider. Your decision making will be based on what you see on the outside. And you won't consider that that place you just chose to take your family, the place you just chose to put your household is wicked. And Christians all the time fall into the same trap. There is a there is a problem on the inside of worldliness, and it's bound to come out and exhibit itself. And they don't choose based on faith. They don't consider that Sodom and Gomorrah. Can I say that to you? Can I say that to you that way? Is wicked, right. and all because the spirit is out of control. We choose what we find, and what we. I'm not saying well, but. We choose based on what we see instead of, wait a minute, that place is going to be judged by God. Yeah, right. That place is wicked. And he didn't also, the writer said, did not consider the future destiny of the place he chose, which was destruction. He didn't consider the inward um, behavior or content, which was wickedness, and he didn't consider the future destiny of Sodom and Gomorrah, which was wicked. And that's every time when we leave the path of faith where we'll find ourselves. That's why God, He, he is in, we're, we are in a trial of faith. And our possession, we don't, a man's life does not consist in the things which he possesses. I know this is a killjoy message somewhat. But yet, if it wasn't important, the writer, they would not have written about it. Jesus would not have said that the deceitfulness of riches chokes the word. Timothy would not have said to us that the love of money is the root of all evil. I'm focusing on money tonight. But Paul gave us a huge list in Galatians chapter 5 of all of the things that start to come and spew out of a man's heart when he's not believing correctly. Let me read them to you. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 says this, starting in verse 17. The flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery. Fornication. Uncleanness. Lasciviousness. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. He's talking to Christians. If you don't have your faith right, your spirit will be out of control. You don't know what you're capable of if you're not living the life of faith. And my, as my message is on riches and earthly gain tonight, it still applies to everything that we face in this life. It can be covetousness, it can be murder, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a warning of living in sin. The man who lives in sin will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the danger of getting off the path of faith and finding ourselves like Lot did in 
Sodom and Gomorrah. Can I say that? In a place, a wicked place, a place that is going to have the judgment of God is thinking right. upon it. But when we get outside of the path of faith, just for riches, just for earthly gain, we'll find ourselves not considering God's will for us. I'm going to go back to 1 Peter chapter 1. And read one more time, verse 6 and 7. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Hey, it's just saying the verse again. Amen. <laughs> but listen. God is looking to try our faith. And that is what will be found under praise and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's the only thing you can take with you to heaven is your faith. <clears throat> your riches will do you no good. Your earthly gain. What you receive here in this life. What good is that going to be at the appearing of Jesus Christ? Amen. When he ushers in the greatest time the world has ever known. Yes, amen. When he comes back and offers us what we, he told us he would give us. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Yes. That where I am, you may be also. Amen. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. See, because our minds are so on the earthly and the temporal, we care not where Jesus is and when, when he's coming back. We do not care. We're not looking. We're not watching and being ready for the trumpet to sound. Because we're looking for the next raise we can get. We're looking for the next house that we can find. We're looking for the next thing that we can have. But in our spirits, the Holy Spirit, he is moving us to a place where our things that we have here and now, they don't give us joy. But what God has prepared for those who love Him, that gives us joy. And that's what God wants for us all. That we would seek first the kingdom of God. And I want to deal with another thing tonight while I'm making everybody mad. That's the reason Christians don't give tithes and offerings. We don't give to the work of God because we care more about what I can get here and now. We don't let go of the things we have to bless the work of God, in turn God blessing us because we not, we're not living by faith, number one, and we're trying to build our kingdom. Ooh. Come on. That's it. I know I stepped on some toes. <laughs> because the love of money is the root of all evil. Yes. <laughs> but, G, but Paul said, if you want to prove the sincerity of your love, give. Not to me. I'm not asking for your money. I'm not asking for your money. But I'm telling you that God, I think and believe, that He placed tithe and offering in the Bible because He knew the love of money is the root of all evil. And we will find ourselves out of control being, assert, being acquisitive people, being those who only want what material things we can find in this life, so He asked us to give. He asked us to give of our earthly things. He asked us to do that. It's a test of your faith. Have you ever thought of that? Giving a test of my faith? And I'm not talking about a one-time gift. You should be a giver. 
You should be someone who gives your tithe and offering to the storehouse of God all the time. And you should, the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. I remember I had to sit down with my wife one night because we were going to give a substantial amount of money. <laughs> we were going to bless the work of God. Anybody ever just got it? I mean, the spirit starts flowing and all of a sudden it swells up in your heart. I want to give to God's work. Yes. Yes. I want to see God's kingdom yes. go forward. I want to see the gospel preached in all the world. And in your spirit, you just desire to give to God. And I just like, I went, whoa, wait a minute, Mary. We got to sit down and tell ourselves why we're doing this. Because we get in a mindset of, well, we start, like I said, we start thinking about all the wonderful things we can have in this life. But see, when we give to the work of God, it puts everything in perspective. And I, we sat down, and I actually forget the exact scripture we read. I just wanted to say, Mary, we've got to remind ourselves that the reason why we give is because we don't, we're, we, we are not of this world. I, we, that's the, that's the, really the, the thing we came to. We're not of this world, and I'm not concerned about laying up treasures for myself here and now. So I want to give to the work of God because what I'm giving to has an eternal weight and value. And that night, I, amen, amen, amen. I'll go out of here with three of you, amen, and that's okay. Because, hallelujah, amen. But because... The Spirit of God is driving us to have our faith in the correct object and to understand, as I said, it's a trial of our faith that is much more precious than gold. It's faith or riches. I didn't mean I don't mean tonight to tell you that God doesn't want to bless you. If you leave here tonight, and think that, that's not what I'm telling you. I'm really trying to get across the principle that if you're not believing like you should, your spirit will be out of control. You will choose earthly goods and possessions because you're not satisfied with the possessions and the goods that God has provided for you in Christ. And maybe that's all I've come to tell you tonight. That we have to guard our hearts and our minds. Yes. Yes, amen. Because we can get in a place as Christians. I know this to be true in my own heart. Where our minds are so focused on the here and now. That we don't care about the work of God. Just a wonderful thought I had coming up here, you know. In the streets of Jerusalem, in the Millennial Kingdom, talking about those who enjoy wonderful things in this life and those that don't. A young lady will come up to a man who has a beautiful mansion. A beautiful mansion, wonderful rooms, great things, stocked with goods. And she'll say, man, you're blessed. You are. You've got it good. But he can take her back to the place that he used to live. A beaten down shack. A broken down home. And that was his lot in this life. But because our faith is more precious than gold, that faith that he had got him a mansion. Yeah. 
And what he didn't have in this life, he had in glory. Let's stand to our feet tonight. Some of these musicians will come back. Riches won't mean a thing when Jesus Christ comes back. Earthly possessions are not something worth living for. But your faith is the only thing that connects you from here to eternity. Your faith and the trial of it is more precious than gold. Let us be a people who are concerned more about our faith than the things of this world. I know this is a sobering message and one that makes us think, but I believe tonight, if we'll remember the words of Christ, that the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. Not to be pursuing a life of riches. You know, in Timothy it says, those who will be rich. Those who will be rich. Your desire is to be rich, to have great, wonderful things. If we'll get our priorities right, Christians, Amen. if we'll look to the cross, if we'll understand that our faith is more precious to God than gold that perishes, hallelujah, we're going to have one of those mansions one day. Yeah. We're going to find ourselves in heavenly places. Hallelujah. Let's just begin to play something. Maybe we can go back to the promise. Hallelujah. Be prepared a place for us. Hallelujah. I want my mind to be focused on the things of glory. Amen. The things that God's prepared for those that love Him. And the only answer to an out of control spirit, a spirit of a man that thinks and is only concerned with the here and now, is living a life of faith. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. Amen. And if you live by faith in what He's done for you, your spirit, your inward man, God will keep him under control. And guess what? The Bible says he will give you the desires of your heart. He will begin to show you the things he wants for you. Not you choosing for yourself what you want in this life. But let God, as I said earlier, if, unless the Lord builds the house, they who labor, labor in vain that build it. Let God build your future. Let God. Hallelujah. Let Him do the work for you. Let Him tell you where you need to go. Let Him choose the job for you. Let Him show you where you need to put your kids in school. Let Him show you what His future is for you. And guess what? It's a place prepared, undef undefiled, in incorruptible. And it's reserved in heaven for you. If you live by faith, if you'll understand that living your faith is more precious than gold and that it's the only thing you have can control you have that connects you to heavenly places your faith is the only thing that will grant you entrance into heaven your faith is the only thing that matters Hallelujah. dear heavenly father I thank you tonight for your word I thank you for the truth that the trial of our faith is more precious than gold. And Father, I just ask that you do a work in us. If we have gotten off track like a lot, if we begin to choose things based on the outward appearance, and we've not decided based on faith, Lord, I'd ask you to convict us tonight. Show us where we have erred. Lord, those in Timothy's book pierced themselves through with many sorrows. They erred from the faith because of the love of money and because of covetousness. But tonight, I ask you, Lord, that you would give us a renewal in our spirit and that you would convict those who have gotten off track. And Lord, that you would show us that there is nothing more important than our faith. And our faith is to be what you did for us. Yes. Lord, I thank you.